welcome everybody to this, this webinar. Uh, my name is Victor Borges and I'm responsible for DNVGLs, RAM tools, Mara, Styro and Sensitivity Manager. So today uh, we are going to discuss the challenges of estimating storage capacities in tank farms. So this will be done through a number of sensitivity cases performed by a new application that we developed, uh, the Sensitivity Manager. Uh, the agenda for today's webinar uh, includes a quick introduction to tank farms, uh, followed by a brief discussion around performance calculation methods. Uh, then we will uh, look at the case study showing a simple oil distribution network and check the results for the base case. Uh, after that, we will play with some of the base case variables using Sensitivity Manager and check a number of design options. You know, um, and finally, uh, we are going to discuss where we could take this study if we had more time and more information. Um, so, what are tank farms, right? I think that's the first question and personally I like to start with definitions. Uh, as a central subject of this webinar is tank farms, let's start with that. According to uh, PetroWiki, not sure if you ever heard, it's a really good website where you can actually find a lot of uh, engineering um, definitions. Uh, tank farm is a group of supply or storage tanks. So these, the, the, the tank farms are formed by a number of storage tanks and the prime function of these storage tanks are store feedstock to supply a process, uh, store a product from a process prior to export and as intermediate storage between processes. So uh, from a performance prediction perspective, we are interested in the volume that is running through the system. So that's what really matters, is how much volume we have running through a particular system. Um, so these tanks can be defined, in, in light of that, these tanks can be defined by their storage capacity, the inflow and the outflow, right? And of course, the difference between the inflow and outflow will describe whether the tanks are filling or emptying. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, these tanks are typically used to meet customer demand by ensuring that there are enough product available to keep, let's say, pipelines or processes in an operational stage. So, so let's try to look at this. Of course, this is a very kind of simplistic um, view of the whole you know, tank farm modeling, but I think that we have basically five important elements there which, you know, are used to, to, to model uh, the supply chain of oil. So, for example, crude oil is exported by via cargo tanks or pipelines from the offshore platform and then delivered to a terminal in preparation for processing. So, basically, we are exporting oil from the production platform to the oil terminal, right? Um, and then uh, we basically prepare this oil to be processed by the, the, the refinery. Um, at the refinery, we can find a number of storage tanks between different processing units. So this, this is pretty much the intermediate storage that I've talked about before. Um, so these tanks, they have uh, basically uh, two, two, two functions, you know, like they, they try to ensure the failures upstream to the tank, so basically failures before the tank are mitigated with product accumulated in the tank until the tank's bottom out. So we can see when we start looking into the case study, we'll see that the tank will start bottom out, it, it depend, depending on how many failures and what is the, the repair time for a specific um, uh, tank. And also, in addition to that, failures downstream to the tank needs to be mitigated by, you know, keep the system running until the tank is full. So if we have any failures, uh, let's say, and a process downstream the tank, the tank will start filling up and we would expect at some point there will be a complete shutdown of the system when you cannot pump oil into the, into the um, the, the tank anymore. So, so this tank, so this intermediate storage is actually quite important for refineries because we don't want to shut down refineries. Refineries they tend to have a pretty big uh, ramp up time, 
So, you know, depending on what process you're shutting down, it may take you a few days to actually put the, the right variables in place before you can actually start producing some refined products. So, these refined products, they are delivered to a terminal storage tank and then they are distributed to the uh, customer. And so this is actually a pretty simplistic view, but it kind of gives you an idea of how tank farms are actually important because they are mitigating failures upstream and downstream to many processes in the oil supply chain. So, so estimating the right size of these tanks is essential to ensure that operational continuity, right? Um, we need to, when we are setting up, when you are defining the storage uh, size, um, we need to consider the balance between capital expenditure, operational expenditure, the deliverability of the products, as well as contractual requirements. So pretty much, we don't want to have an unnecessary massive bank where we had to invest lots of money, right, and we are not utilizing it to, we are not fully utilizing its capacity. But on the other hand, we don't want to have a tank that is too small and keeps stopping out and cannot maintain production from an expected period of time. Um, so, 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 so far, and, and as, um, so far we are only talking about a single tank, but we could also start discussing having multiple tanks with multiple uh, operational states and multiple products. So, so this is all we we been only considering one tank. You know, if you start thinking about more tanks, it becomes even more, um, you know, complex. And to add to all this complexity and all these variables that we need to take to think about, um, we. We, we, we have to consider the dynamic nature of tank farms. So tanks filling up, tanks bottom out, multiple tanks, multiple products, you know, and so it's pretty dynamic the way we are simulating this process. Um, so as you can see, there are a number of variables that must be taken into account if you want to have a comprehensive understanding of uh, the performance of tank farms. So how do we achieve this goal? I think that's, that's the question for today, isn't it? How do we um, you know, model all these variables, capex, opex, you know, storage capacities, inflow, outflow, failures, and all that. So, so th there are basically many methodologies that we can uh, talk about, and um, and we, we we're going to discuss specifically one today, right? So so. There are a few methods that you can use to actually estimate the storage capacity of a, a, a tank farm. Um, so there, there is a traditional method, you know, where you're actually using static calculations to determine the product production loss from tank farms, and 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 it, it is actually quite good. They produce a, a first path through the life cost for an asset. Um, however, by using dynamic simulation techniques, the performance figure will incorporate measures of continuous change in the state of the system. So by actually looking into the dynamics of the system, we can actually look into um, what is the state of the system in a particular point in time and then, you know, later on, right? Uh, so if there is any change, you know. So, so that static is actually good. It gives you a first view of what things are happening, but it's basically a snapshot of, uh, you know, of the approach and it kind of omits the dynamics, right? So by incorporating, you know, the dynamics, um, we can actually find a more realistic uh, performance figure and it basically improves the confidence we have in the predicted values and of course any derived recommendation that we may have. So one of the major benefits of dynamic simulation over traditional methods is the ability to incorporate your understanding of the assets, right? So you know whoever is operating that, that plan knows better and knows how, you know, that particular system should be operating. Um, and of course, basically each asset and operator typically have their own specific issues. So it's, it's normally, you know, an across the board standard solution is not recommended because you know 
each person, each company would have their own kind of a view on, on, on this. So how, do we, how are we going to do this? We are going to use a very well established methodology which is called uh, RAM analysis. Uh, RAM stands for reliability, availability and maintainability. And RAM is basically used to predict the performance of assets. So we are pretty much trying to add a value on the produced volume given that we will have interruptions and there will be some uncertainty regarding what events are happening throughout the life of the system. And also, how long does it take to, to um, take, uh, get the system back online after we have an interrupted production. So it reduces the uncertainty you know, about what impact feature events may have in our system and we can actually plan accordingly, right? If we know that a particular event has a certain impact to a system, we basically can act before and plan ahead, right? So, for, uh, as this methodology is based on the Monte Carlo method, right, we are essentially simulating many, many feasible lives of the system and then extracting information that belongs to, to, the, to, to the system itself, right? And we can actually start looking into the average performance of the system throughout through the time. So, so this methodology allows you to identify bottlenecks and critical events in the system. So, of course, if you have a system that incorporates, let's say, 10,000 equipment items, you don't want to maintain those 10,000 equipment items, you know, at the same level of attention. Some items will be more uh, critical than others, and we need to actually, be, we need to be able to actually identify those those critical items, right? And, you know. Pretty much what we can do is, is uh, once we create our model, we can start looking to uh, modifying the virtual system and in the application and the impact of real assets can be predicted and that even the design or even the a t different type of operation can be chosen that would give basically the best, the optimum performance, right? So looking a bit more towards the um, uh, tank farms, right? Um, you know, by running a RAM study, we can actually make more strategic uh, decisions, right? So, so it would help us to understand if the levels of production achievable from any asset that is connected to the tank farm. So, so we can you can, can look into, all right, is this, uh, is this, you know, LNG terminal? Is this uh, pumping system? Is this actually uh, how how much is that impacting my tank farm? You know, like can I actually keep the level in the tanks that I'm required to? Um, we can also start looking into supply chain issues. You know, like uh, problems, and check if if uh, we can uh, identify what are the main contributors to not delivering products to our customer. And of course, you know, you can in a complex scenario where you have, let's say, a country-wide oil distribution network or a, a gas distribution network, it becomes quite difficult to look into, you know, the different aspects of that particular network. So it's pretty good. This, this, this the run study allows you to actually model that scenario in a, pre, in a pretty good, you know, complete way. So let's start looking into the case study, right? Um, enough of me myself talking. <laughs> uh, let's look into this case study. Uh, we'll be looking into an oil distribution network, you know, where we can actually um, transport oil via pipelines and of course, you know, this oil needs to be constantly pressurized, uh, you know, at, of course at certain points in the, the oil network, in the pipeline, so we can actually keep pumping uh, oil to the design rate. Um, so what we are doing here today, we are going to model four pumping stations, right? So A, B, C, D, and we have basically two uh, oil storage tanks. We have oil storage one at the left hand side, and we have oil storage two at the right hand side, right? Uh, we also have a customer, of course, you know, someone that we are selling this oil to. Um, so just to give us some, uh, uh, we are going to look into the model in five seconds, but station A is handling around 60% of the flow, station B is handling 40% of the flow, 
and of course, you know, we are combining this flow to pump more 100% uh, uh, through station C and station D, right? Um, so, as with any RAM study, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what is the objective of our study? So, the objective of this study is uh, to understand what is the performance of this oil network. So, so what is the production efficiency that we can actually get from this oil network? We want to identify what are the key contributors to, to unavailability. So, so, what are the events or systems or equipment that are shutting down our oil network and making us um, unavailable? Uh, and we are basically focusing on three, on two uh, main issues that we are addressing. You know, we are looking into the storing capacity of these two tanks, and we also look into uh, the um, redundancy we have within these two pumping stations. Uh, this, uh, we are also assuming that this oil network uh, it has been operating for a few years, so it's already in an operational stage. And, and maybe we can actually look into uh, you know what what flow we have running through this system as well. So let me open Maros. You know, um, let me open. Maros 9.1, so so yes, so uh, I hope you can see my screen now. So we have, so this is Maros 9.1, so we released this software uh, about a month ago. Uh, so let's try to understand what is happening here. Uh, we have, the first thing we need to do is define the simulator parameters, right? So as you can see here, we have a system life of 10 years. So basically, our system is running for about 10 years, right? Uh, the number of simulations that we have is 100. So we are basically, so this is part of the Monte Carlo method. So 100 here basically means that we are running 100 different lives of the system, and each life has 10 years, right? So that's what we are trying to, to model. Uh, the starting date is 2020, so we have a system that is starting five years from now. Uh, for this particular, you know, um, for this particular estimate that we are we are doing, uh, and we have oil, right? So we are we can produce um, we are producing oil. Delivery data is in years, and repair data is in hours. So every time we look into some reliability data, which refers to delivery data is in years and repair data is in hours. All right. So let's look into the flow network. You know what we have. We have a, a nice map here uh, where we can actually see the pumping station A. We can see that it's pumping 60. You know, it, it, uh, sorry. If I open this again, thousands of barrels, right? So we're looking into thousands of barrels a day as the volume, the the, the race, the production rate we are modeling for this system. Um, so we have 60 there. And we have 40 uh, from pumping station B, right? And of course, you know, downstream to this um, to this two pump stations, we have you know storage one, which can actually take 100,000 barrels a day. Storage, uh, I mean, as tank transfer, so it can transfer up to 100,000 barrels a day, which is pretty much the combination of 60 plus 40. Uh, and then we have 100 in pump station C, 100 in pump station D, and 100 at our uh, storage tank two, right? So uh, then we have an oil customer which is uh, receiving this uh, production and is basically selling, right? We're not looking into any shipping at this particular model, but just for the sake of uh, you know, uh, making sure that it's understandable in in an hour, right? Um, so let's look into what flow we have running through this system, right? So if I go to view, flow and table, right? We have a constant flow, right? So we have uh, 60, again, 60,000 barrels a day running through station A, 
which is one of the feed units, and then we have uh, the feed unit which is pumping station B with 40, right? Um, we could actually have some transient flow if we wanted to. Uh, uh, it's not the focus here for this particular uh, webinar, but we could have in offshore production systems, you tend to have a lot of um, um, variation when it comes to the production rate as you are phasing in wells and phasing out wells, you know, commissioning wells or decommissioning wells. Uh, so we can actually produce up to 100 barrels a day, 1,000 barrels a day, but we are only demanded to produce 90. So if I look at this in a graphical format, you can see that you know this is uh, this is our potential here, and the black line here that's our demand. So although we can produce 90,000 barrels a day. We are only demanded by contract, or I don't know. It's, uh, our customer will only take 90 barrels a day, 90,000 barrels a day. So we can also look into the oil uh, contribution for each one of the pumping stations. So A and B. Uh, B is the blue, and A is the green one. All right. So as I said before, uh, this uh, Oil storage, the storage tanks, they are normally defined as uh, what you have, yeah, what is the storage capacity, what is the inflow, and what is the outflow. If I right click on any storage tank and look into the properties, I can see that we have the tank transfer rates, so that's pretty much how much this tank can actually process when it comes to product. We have an initial volume, right? And we have the max volume of 50,000 barrels, right? So that's the fixed volume that we can actually pump into this tank. So what we are saying is that we can pretty much take half day of full production, right? And uh, what we are going to do, we are going to investigate, you know, if this is enough for us to keep running our system. And of course, you have another number of uh, properties and uh, configurations that you can do for this storage tank if you wanted to make it look a bit more similar to what you have in your assets. Uh, if I then, the oil storage tank, it doesn't have any equipment item, but if I then look into, let's say, pump station D, we have a subsystem there. So if I click on this, station D, I can see there is, I have a number of subsystems within the system, right? So we have an oil pipeline failures, we have valves, we have power generation, we have some system, pumping station, right? A big system. So all this, you know, this is part of the reliability block diagrams. So this is a pretty well-established uh, methodology as well. It's traditionally used uh, in reliability assessments where you can actually have, you know, blocks in series and blocks in parallel. So we can see here that all the blocks are in series, meaning that if you have a block in series, it's pretty much that you require that block to be active so you can keep producing, right? But if I go down into the pumping station, we can see that we have a um, parallel block. So what is a parallel block? A parallel block means that if a failure happens in the top block, for example, right, we can keep producing from block two, okay? So there is some redundancy there, and that's one of the things that we are going to explore today as well. Um, so this particular system has only 75% of redundancy. So we need pretty much we need to have both parallel blocks running to get full capacity. But if one of them fails, we can keep producing with 75%. If I go down one level there, I can start looking to my subsystems within the the parallel blocks, and then I can go up to the level of my failure mode, right? So my failure mode is used to define um, equipment failures, right? Um, the equipment failures, they of course, we cannot, we don't know when a, a failure will happen, right? We cannot predict exactly when a failure can happen. You know, we can give like warning periods using, let's say, condition monitoring, but you cannot say, you oh, know, 1st of January 2014, a certain failure would happen, right? So what we need to do, we need to actually assign some statistical distribution to all these uh, um, failure modes, right? And 
this statistical distribution is going to be used as an indication of when we should expect this failure to occur. All right, so if I go, if I open my simulator parameters again, right, we can see that failure data is in years. So we have, as a failure type, we have an exponential distribution, which is uh, takes four years, right? So mean time to failure is four years. So this pretty much means that we is likely for us to uh, have four years of um, uh, uninterrupted uh, production. So we should expect a failure within four years, right? And the repair data is in hours. So we can see here, if I just shut this down a bit and scroll to the right, we can see that we have a rectangular distribu distribution, right? And it's, uh, so we should expect a repair time between 50.3 and 60 hours. So look that. So uh, it's in hours. So once this fails, we should expect a 50 to 60 hours of downtime. And of course, this is for a single equipment item, right? If I look into my equipment table, right, I can actually look into all the failure remotes I have within my system, right? Um, so you can see that I have like critical failures, I have fails to, to start control, leaks of bearings and ceiling and all, all that overflows, degraded stuff. Um, so we have a number of failure modes. We have a, a lot of failure modes, and also we have some annual shutdown, as you can see here, right? So we have some plant maintenance going on there, um, and of course we can actually manage this so to make sure that we don't have things overlapping. You know, of course we don't want to have an overlap. Uh, you know, we don't want to have station A um, in maintenance and also station B at the same time. We may we may want to actually stagger or you know, be a bit more clever on how we are scheduling this plant maintenance. All right, um, so look into the flow network again. So this is how it is arranged, right? Um, if, I, if I go to the resource view, we also have some maintenance going on here. So we can actually look into, uh, for this particular system, I'm only investigating the crews that we have, right? Uh, so we have station A, we have station B, station C and, and station D, right? So we have a mechanical crew at station C, and of course it takes some time to travel from station C to station D and, and station A and station B, because we, we are talking about pipeline, right? Um, and in regards to the constraints we have for these systems, we, ha we, want, we have only one crew available for, 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 for uh, repass, and it, it takes then uh, between one to two hours to mobilize, and uh, they have a shift, right? So they're not working full time. They only work from eight in the morning to six in the afternoon, right? Uh, okay, so another thing that's pretty important about this model is that, you know, if you look into the, the again, if you look into the flow profile, the flow network that we have, uh, we obviously want to have some priority of repair. Why is that? Because station D and C, if they shut down, uh, we have an interruption here, right? So we shut down the whole system. Uh, is station C the same thing as station D? So if this one shuts down, right, we have the full system shut down. But look at station D, uh, sorry, station A. If station A shuts down, uh, we still have station B operating. Right, if station B shuts down, we still have station A operating. But you know, the priority of station A must be bigger than the priority of station B because it's producing more. And of course, we want to make to bring online the system that produces more first. So station C and D, they have the highest priority. Is station A second in priority, and station B uh, th third in priority. Right, so if I run this model, let's see what we get. You know, and when I run this model, I'm going to use the multi-core functionality we have in Maros. So Maros can actually use the multiple cores you have in your processor. We have a reporting interval of one day, right? So we can explore a bit more, and we I'm generating the animation, right? So um, as I should expect, let's look into the 
running efficiency, right? So this graph is pretty much showing us the multi-color map running behind the scenes. The x-axis is a the life cycles we are running. So one life cycle, one, two, three, four, five. Each one of the life cycles they have different estimates, and uh, we can actually look in, start looking into the average of the production uh, for this particular system, right? So we finish our run now. We are combining the results, and you know, uh, Mars will show us the report view. Uh, the report view is a summary of everything that's going on in your model, right? So, for example, we can see at the left hand side that the expected uh, production efficiency after running uh, 75 life cycles is 10 years, right? And we have, sorry, it's 96.8% um, in a life of 10 years. Um, so we are basically losing 3.2% of production. Uh, we can also we can also look into the um, produ expected production for for each one of the years. So the green is the production volume. The 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 blue is the are the losses, right? So if I click in one year, I can actually look into monthly. And if I click again, I can see daily. So that's why I decided to actually use the reporting period in daily because I can see some daily estimates, right? Uh, and of course, we can see that it's actually we have some spread of failures, you know, throughout the life cycle of our system. Um, we can then look into the criticality, right? So the subsystem criticality, uh, we have uh, station D and station C as being the most critical ones and we discussed this you know like if you look at the flow na network you know like you see that station D and C they can if they shut down we actually bottlenecking the whole system we are shutting down the whole system um, and then we have station A again we, we kind of predicted this uh, station A as it produce more if you have a failure there we then um, have a big shutdown um, with 60% of our system going out. And then we have station B, you know, the, the, the lowest one and in criticality. And we have a number of results that we can explore, right? Uh, we can start looking into, you know, buffer analysis, you know, like so looking into what is the product, the, let me just open a graph there who show us everything. So we can start looking into the probability of uh, exceedance for this, right? Um, and we can start looking into the actual levels for the for the the tank. So, but you know, one of the key things we can look at, and if I flip back to the asset view, right? I'll, I'll give you a few seconds so it, the screen can catch up. Um, we can start looking into the the animation. So, how is the system actually dynamically behaving, right? So, what we have here, we have Station A producing 60, Station B producing 40, and then we have, you know, we are basically exporting 90. But you can see that we are producing 100, right? So the difference, again, as I explained before, the difference between the outflow of the storage tank and the inflow of the storage tank will give us how much oil we are accumulating in the storage tanks, right? So if I press play here, Oh, sorry, let me just yeah, let me just change this to let's say twelve hours, right? If I press play there and I start looking to a more kind of a uh, um, speedy wipe, right? So, so we have a bunch of failures happening. Uh, so let me just try to find uh, just try to find a a point where we can actually see the storage tanks going up. So we chose a life cycle that is not showing that. So let me just rerun this for a another life cycle. Um, let me just rerun this for life cycle one. Uh, and I run this for a test just for us to check the animation again. So again we run the multi color method, it's producing the results. You can see it's quite fast. So we can run uh, as many cases as we want. So if I press play that, let's see how that goes now. Press play. Press play that. Oh, sorry. So that's a bit too fast now. 
Um, so if we go to the start of the system life, we, again we can see here there's a 90 production, uh, the tanks exports in 90 and we are with the inflow of the tanks sit 100. The best next event, you can see there's a failure happening at station C already, right? So that's one of the things we can actually expect. No, you know, infant failures and, and shutdowns, right? Um, so that uses the storage tank. But just let me see if I can actually find. So there you go. So, so when we pump, uh, when the tank tops out, what we do? We adjust the production coming from station C and D, and we can actually, you know, start looking into filling up, uh, you know, storage tank one as well. So we can see here that now we have storage tank full, right? And we have storage tank one and two full. And if I jump to the next event, you know, let's see what that is. We have a degraded failure at pump A, right? And that's basically start using some of the capacity in storage one. So if I press play, right, you see that a number of events will be happening. And we can see the storage tank Topping out, popping out, uh, topping out, bottom out, and you know all the dynamics that is, are going on in the system. And of course, we are keeping track of how much oil we are producing. So this is the base case. So this is what we are going to use to investigate, right? Uh, so if I shut down Maris now, all right. So if I shut down Maris, yeah. What we can do, we can start looking to. Um, a new product which is called Sensitivity Manager. So Sensitivity Manager is a new application that we developed uh, around uh, last year. It took us another, uh, another year to develop this. So what it does, it helps us to manage all the um, help us to manage all the, 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 the sensitivity scenarios we have for a specific case. So for instance I can start you know, adding, for example, a our model, right? So our Mara's model. When I add our Mara's model, sensitivity manager is going to prompt Mara's in the back, and it's going to say, "All right, so this is a Mara's model because you can also load Taro models here." Um, it's going to say, "All right, this is a tar Mara's model. I'm going to load this, and I'm going to load the the flow network, so we can actually." understand what you're talking about. So we can view the flow network, which is pretty good because it helps you understand what you expect from the system, right? But you cannot edit, right? The idea is that you don't edit anything. You have a single model, a consistent model that can be used to run sensitivities. Um, so after loading the, the, the base case, what we can do, we can add sensitivity cases so right, so we have uh, the base case, and we can, I can add some sensitivity cases. So let's say I add sensitivity one and sensitivity two, right? So let's say I want to investigate my first sensitivity is trying to understand which one of these storage tanks are the most important one, right? So if I increase the capacity uh, in storage tanks, let me just go a bit beyond that. So if I increase my capacity in storage tank 2, do I get more production? Or if I increase my capacity in storage tank 1, do I get more production? So which one of these options will give me more production, right? So how do I do that? I add two sensitivity cases by pressing Add Sensitivity. If I click on Sensitivity 1, I can drag and drop from the Sensitivity Types panel on the right-hand side I can drag and drop sensitivities. So if I drag and drop tank sensitivities to the main line, the main screen, I can see that now I have a tank sensitivity. And once I press, press the, play, the, oh, the plus button, I can select what storage tank I want to, to investigate. So let's say storage one, we have sensitivity uh, one with the storage one. And you can also see on the background grayed out you can see this, the, the defined values, right? So we know storage one is actually can handle only 50,000 barrels as capacity, and I want to see what if I have 100 barrels, right? What if I have a double? What if I can actually take up to one day of production, right? Then I move to actually a sensitivity two, 
and I can add another tank sensitivity, right? So when I add another tank sensitivity, I can again press the plus button, and now I want to select storage two. And again, storage two has the same definition as storage one, but let's look at this, right? So the sensitivity manager would also show you what are the changes you are doing to the base case. So sensitivity one is a copy of the base case with the only the only difference that we have is that storage one, which is this one, has 100 barrels of storing capacity, and we have storage two, which has another uh, sensitivity two, which then has storage two with a, another 100 barrels. So we are isolating these two cases and trying to understand what to expect from both of them. So if I run this model now, if I run this project, uh, we, we, we call this a project. If I run this project, you know, and I, I, of course I have to save this. I can save oil network, right? When I save this and I run, what Sensitivity Manager does is going to prompt Maros uh, batch running feature because Maros can use the multiple cores of your computer to run individual models, right? So let's say if you have four, uh, uh, quad-core processor, you can run four products at the same time. So there you go, we run three products, you know, it's compiling all the results, and then the first thing that prompts us is the comparison view. And this is so important, this is really good, because instead of looking to individual uh, reports, we can actually combine the reports now for each case and investigate them in more details, right, in more detail. So, for example, if you look at this line here, we can see that the, there is a legend on, on the top, so the green is the base case, the blue is the um, uh, sensitivity one, and the sensitivity two is the pink one. So I can hide these panels so we can have a better look of what we are trying to do here. Um, if I look in my average uh, forward slash required efficiency, we can see that uh, for the base case, we get the 97.1 that we were expecting, and then for the sensitivity one, which includes the increasing storage capacity for oil storage one, we get an in 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 increased production of 0.2 percent, so we get 97.4, and also for our sensitivity two, where we increase the capacity of storage tank uh, two, we can see there's increase on production of 0.8%. Uh, this might be a bit, you know, hard to look at all these numbers. So what we develop is this delta view. So if you click on the top right, there is a delta view which is going to show you exactly what is the difference between the base case and the sensitivities, right? Um, so yeah, there you go. So we have now, now we know that increasing storage to uh, is more effective than increasing storage um, one, right? So, so this is pretty important now because now we're going to focus our, you know, our capacity of increasing storage tanks uh, in, in storage two instead of focusing on both tanks. And of course, this allows us to invest in on, only one tank. That's going to give us more back. And of course, you know, that's what we want. We want to have some in terms of uh, challenging oil prices, we want to make sure that our capex is invested in the right place. All right, so let's say we assume that this case is the case that we want to see, right? This is the case that we want to bring forward. So what we can do, I can say, look, I want to view this model in Maros, right? So Sensitivity Manager is going to produce a new model, right? And it's going to prompt Maros for us. So you can see Maros is, uh, is um, shiny on the back. So if I go now to sensitivity 2, I can right click and see that this max capacity now is 100,000 barrels, right? So we basically select that sensitivity and say, look, I want to bring forward this sensitivity. All right, so now what what is the maximum, you know, like how, you know, of course, the, the must, we must find a balance between compacts and uh, operational costs and all of that, but 
what is the what is a good storing capacity for oil storage too? You know, I can increase this to up to let's say ten days of production, but it might not be as you know, it might of course they'll be effective, but the gain that we get might not be uh, as 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 big as you know with uh, nine days of production. Or uh, so, what is the optimum uh, storage size? If I save this model again, if I save this. Let's say um, go to my um, uh, storage tank. Let's save this as case number two, right? And what I can do, I can then close my eyes again, and I can load case two, right? In sensitivity manager. So if I load case two in sensitivity manager, uh, we are then loading a second model, right? And of course, we can start looking into uh, more sensitivities, right? So let's say I want to see um, what if I increase now this storage uh, 50,000 barrels more uh, to 150,000 barrels, then 200 and 250. What, what, what if we do that, right? So I can add another three sensitivities. And the same thing, right? So I can add tank sensitivity one. I select storage two, and I say, all right. So now I want to have 150,000 barrels. Oh, sorry. But this is 250. This is case three. For case one, I want to have 150. So 50 more. For case two, I want to have 200. So if I add that as 200 and then what we can do we can then look again what are we amending right so sensitivity to one we are increasing the storage capacity of storage two from 100 to 150 sensitivity two we are increasing the storage capacity from 100 to 200 and sensitivity three we are increasing from 100 to 250 if I then we run this case right so I want to save them the the project now and yeah, yeah. So I want you to run this. Um, so again, my, uh, sensitivity manager is prompting Maros on the background, uh, and we can actually start looking into you know what are re what are results we should expect from this system uh, in a few seconds when we load all the all the uh, all, all the models. So sensitivity manager allows you to easily, you know, combine all your sensitivity cases under one specific application, and allows you to edit, you know, uh, you know, specific variables in your um, system to to run some 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 variations of your base case. You know, you can change a lot of things. You can change like failure data. You can change, uh, you know, the time of timing of your maintenance, your plan maintenance, right? So, all right. So I want to see. I want. I don't want to see these results. I don't want to see these results. I don't want to see these results. I want only want to see oil network one, two, three, right? So what we can see here, we can see that we're actually increasing a lot, you know, from 98%, which is pretty much what we got in sensitivity in the first case, and we increase 0.5% when we add another 50, then we increase 0 0.3, 0 0.8, which is 0 0.3 from sensitivity 2, and then we're increasing 1.1. But if I click on this button here, I can actually start comparing sensitivities amongst themselves, right? So what is the step between sensitivity 1 and sensitivity 2, 0 0.3? What is the step between sensitivity 2 and sensitivity 3? So if I just uncheck that box, I can see it's only 0 0.2. So that's what we expect. Maybe the 0 0.2 is not enough performance back to pay for this extra capacity in our tank. All right. Um, okay. So we can actually start looking into many things, right? So we can then I can then add, for example, the same case again. You know, uh, sorry, I add um, you know same case again. And what I can do, I can start looking into, for example, the parallel blocks. You know, so if I uh, add another, let's say, two sensitivities here. 
you know, of course I can change the name of this if I want, parallel block, block, two times 100%. So, what if, block, two times 100%. So, what if I, instead of having a two times 75%, I have a two times 100%. Right? So if I, all I need to do is, again, drag and drop, parallel block rate sensitivity that I press the plus button and I start I can look for parallel blocks in my system right and sensitivity, sensitivity manager has this very clever thing here which allows you to expand only the acceptable changes so we're not expanding all the systems because only a few systems have parallel blocks so I can add for example parallel block B I can add another one and say I want to check parallel block A. I want to add another two. And I can add you no know, for example effects C and I can change also parallel block D. Right. Um, all right, so I can change all this. You know, like what if I buy more like expensive pumps that can process more? So this is typically part of a revamping project where you want to say, all right, so 10 years ago I had to produce 100 barrels, uh, you know, 75,000 barrels, but now I have to produce 100 because we are putting more more tanks in line online now, more wells, sorry, more wells online, and all right. So what is the what is the benefit of adding? amending all the storage, uh, all this pile of block capacity. So let's rerun again. Let's see what we get back. 